Welcome to the third module of chapter 15. This is actually one of the sort of shorter modules, which is kind of interesting because when we talk about mental illness, the anxiety and the mood disorders are definitely the most prevalent. Um, but in this section, we are going to talk about anxiety, obsessive compulsive and depressive disorders. So anxiety disorders are a category of disorders involving fear or nervousness that is excessive, irrational and maladaptive. They're among the most frequently diagnosed disorders. So approximately one in eight Canadians um, <clears throat> is going to be diagnosed with an anxiety disorder at some point. Occasional experience of anxiety, of course, is normal. Everyone worries about things at times. But what separates anxiety disorders from the normal experience is the intensity and the duration of the response. And that's something you're going to see for almost any mental illness is that a lot of the things that people are feeling and the things that people are thinking are relatively normal. But the thing that distinguishes you know, average behavior from disordered behavior would be that duration. So it's lasting a lot longer than it should and the intensity. So it's a lot more severe than it should be, um, as well as the relevance to one's current circumstances. So when anxiety is disproportional to or detached from the situation and prolonged in intensity, it's considered to be disordered. Psychologists have identified distinct patterns of experience that have given rise to several major types of anxiety disorders, such as generalized anxiety disorder or GAD, panic disorder, which can actually lead to another disorder called agoraphobia, as well as phobias. So we'll talk a bit about specific phobias and also about um, social anxiety disorder, which was formerly known as social phobia. So generalized anxiety disorder involves frequently elevated levels of anxiety generally from the normal challenges and stresses of everyday life. So basically, someone with GAD, they stress about the same things that the average person would, but their reactions, their stress reactions or anxiety reactions are either prolonged or much more intense than they should be. So a person with GAD fears disaster lurking around every corner. People with generalized anxiety may have trouble sleeping, breathing or concentrating. However, as the anxiety arises out of ongoing situations and circumstances, People who suffer from GAD typically have a hard time understanding their experience and identifying specific reasons for why they are so anxious. So a lot of the time someone with generalized anxiety might be feeling anxious, but they can't really connect it to one specific thing in their life. It just they have an overwhelming kind of feeling of worry and anxiety pretty much most of the time, the majority of the time. So this makes their anxiety very difficult to resolve as anxiety constantly switches its source as each issue is dealt with. So no matter what happens, how many things they fix, there always seems to be something else to worry about. So people with generalized anxiety disorder typically have unstable, irritable moods and they experience difficulties in their day to day functioning. Panic disorder is an anxiety disorder marked by occasional episodes of sudden, very intense fear. So it's distinct from GAD because anxiety occurs in short segments, but can be much more severe. So generalized anxiety, those type of people are kind of feeling generally anxious the majority of the time over a variety of different circumstances. Whereas with panic disorder, people have what we call panic attacks. So a panic attack is a brief moment of extreme anxiety that includes a rush of physical activity paired with frightening thoughts. And so we actually spent quite a deal, quite a good deal of time studying panic disorder and panic attacks and their symptoms in my course last semester in psychopathology. So I'll read out some of the symptoms of a panic attack. So basically for something to be classified as a panic attack, it has to include at least four or more of the following symptoms. And basically it's an abrupt surge of intense fear or intense comfort that reaches a peak within minutes. So you can have palpitations, pounding heart or accelerated heart rate, sweating, trembling or shaking, sensations of shortness of breath, feelings of choking, chest pain or discomfort, nausea or abdominal distress, feeling dizzy, unsteady, unsteady lightheaded or faint, chills or heat sensations, paresthesias, which is numbing or tingling sensations, derealization, so kind of having a feeling of unreality, fear of losing control or going crazy, and fear of dying. So there's those 13 symptoms. You don't have to memorize them, of course. I just wanted to kind of give you some examples. And if you're experiencing four or more within kind of an intense bout of anxiety, then that will be considered a panic attack. So a substantial subset of people with panic disorder develop a recurring fear that panic will strike again, particularly while in an environment where they would be exposed and unable to escape. This fear can result in agoraphobia, which I kind of briefly mentioned earlier. So it's an intense fear of having a panic attack in public. 
As a result of this fear, the individual may begin to avoid public settings and increasingly isolate him or herself. In extreme cases, dealing with agoraphobia can cause you to refuse to leave your home at all because you're scared of being away from that safe place or potentially a safe person in your life. Um, and actually, I'm going to be doing a presentation to my adult intervention course next week where I'm going to be talking in detail about panic disorder and agoraphobia. And I'm pretty excited for it because I find it to be a really interesting disorder. So with agoraphobia, um, you actually have marked fear or anxiety about two or more of the following five situations. So there are kind of five different situations in which you can have an agoraphobic reaction. Using public transportation, being in open spaces, being in enclosed spaces, standing in line or being in a crowd, or simply just being outside of the home alone. So you can see how in extreme cases when this fear starts to generalize and the person starts to become terrified of you know, having panic attacks in a bunch of these different situations, a lot of the time that will lead to them pretty much kind of never really feeling able to leave their home at all. A phobia is a severe irrational fear of a very specific object or situation. So they're often divided into two broad categories. You can have a specific phobia, which involves an intense fear of a specific object, activity, or organism. So for example, having fear of a specific animal like dogs, spiders, snakes, fear of heights, fear of thunder, fear of blood, all of those will be considered specific phobias. And we have table 15.2 here, which kind of goes through a few of those, um, just the different types of phobias that you can have, as well as some examples. I won't go too far into them because I know we mentioned phobias when we did the learning chapter last semester, but it's just kind of to let you know some of the general categories that phobias tend to fall into. Um, and so that would be specific phobias. The other type of phobia that people might have is social phobia. Um, and we actually used to have a diagnosis for social phobia. It's now labeled social anxiety disorder, um, but the, the traits remain the same. So we'll talk a little bit about that on the next slide here. So social anxiety disorder is a very strong fear of being judged by others or being embarrassed or humiliated in public. People who have social anxiety tend to develop familiar routines and exit strategies for when they go out in public. So they wanna make sure they're not caught in a social situation where they won't be able to escape. And social anxiety generally leads people to limit their social activities, making it difficult to lead a normal life. And I know I mentioned this um, in, the last, in the last module as well, but again, avoidance we see plays a really, really strong role in a lot of these disorders. And so what happens with social anxiety disorder is that people tend to avoid these feared situations. Um, and of course that makes them feel better in the short run because they don't have to go through the stress of engaging in the social interaction. But in the long run, it basically reinforces their avoidance. And so they're less and less likely to kind of engage in social interactions. So the only way to treat this type of disorder or one of, I guess, the major ways to treat would be through exposure. So by exposing yourself to those situations and realizing that those really negative outcomes typically are unlikely to occur, that can make people realize that um, they, they probably you know shouldn't fear these situations as much as they do and that's one of the major treatments for for disorders like social anxiety i'm actually conducting a mini course of intervention with a standardized patient right now so somebody who's acting as a patient and i have to kind of be their therapist and my client was diagnosed with social anxiety disorder so i've been reading a lot lately about the best methods for treating social anxiety and um kind of just about you know its background and things like that so again this is all the detail i'm going to give you here you don't need to know any of these disorders in depth and anytime i kind of list off you know kind of rambling symptoms for things just feel free to like kind of ignore me in terms of your actual testing i won't be asking you for example the list of panic attack symptoms um, i'm just giving you the extra information in case you're interested so focus on kind of what's in the slides and maybe some of the major examples i might give but you don't have to memorize all the symptoms or anything for any of these disorders. So as you may have noticed, anxiety disorders tend to be self-perpetuating. So the anxiety leads to circumstances that provoke further anxiety. So it, it can be really, really difficult to kind of break that cycle. But avoiding or interrupting this vicious cycle is central to the treatment of anxiety disorders. So instead of trying to minimize contact with the feared situation, like I was just talking about with social anxiety, um, the, the general treatment for a lot of these anxiety disorders is to practice confronting the fear. So the most important part of psychological therapy for anxiety disorders is that concept of exposure that I kind of just mentioned a little bit. 
The person is repeatedly and in stages exposed to the object of their fear so that they can work past their emotional reactions. So essentially, the, the only way you can kind of eliminate these fears, whether it's a specific phobia or social anxiety, is to confront the situations that cause you fear. And the more you confront them and realize that they're not that dangerous and they, they don't have, you know, maybe the risks that you have imagined in your mind, the more likely you are able to continue engaging in those situations and to kind of um, allow yourself to be almost conditioned out of that fear in a way. So for exposure to work, it should be coupled with helping the person to calm themselves down and learn to tolerate aversive feelings as they arise. Um, this is something really interesting. So when we used to talk about exposure therapy, it was recommended for something like systematic desensitization that you essentially expose people gradually to the stimulus. So maybe first with pictures, maybe then with videos, maybe then having the stimulus in the room with them, but kind of at a distance. And at every stage, you should teach them to use kind of relaxation activities or something. And while that is still used sometimes, that kind of systematic desensitization where you're pairing the feared stimulus with some kind of relaxation technique, um, it actually has been shown that you don't need that relaxation component in order for exposure to work. And actually, sometimes when you do include that component, um, it can become what we call a safety behavior. So it actually makes the uh, exposure less likely to gen generalize because the person kind of starts to relate that behavior, that relaxation behavior with um, the exposure to the stimulus. So therefore, if they're not able to engage in that behavior, they might still see a resurgence in the fear. So actually at this point, um, we kind of lean more towards recommending not including that relaxation component in exposure treatments. Now we'll talk a bit about obsessive compulsive disorder. I know I mentioned um, this one a little bit when I talked about obsessive compulsive personality disorder in the last module, and I did do kind of a giant project last semester on OCD and its different subtypes and symptoms and things. Um, so until 2013, which was when the DSM-5 was released, our newest edition of the DSM, obsessive compulsive disorder was actually considered to be an anxiety disorder but now it has been placed into its own category. There's actually a section in the DSM now of obsessive compulsive disorders. Um, so there's a, a couple different ones that kind of fit in that category. So OCD is a disorder characterized by unwanted, inappropriate and persistent thoughts, which we call obsessions, and repetitive, often quite ritualistic behaviors, which we call compulsions. And so generally what happens is the compulsive behavior serves as a means of coping with the anxiety caused by the obsession. So for example, a very common subtype of OCD is a contamination OCD, which is where somebody fears that they're being contaminated by germs. Um, it could be from food, it could be from you know public places, um, but the overall fear is being contaminated. Um, and so in this type of OCD, the person becomes they have obsessions of being contaminated and you know having germs on them and then the compulsive behavior that goes along with that is engaging in kind of ritualistic hand cleaning maybe they might you know wash their hands five times um, after touching a doorknob or something like that so you can see in table 15.3 here there's actually a few different kind of specific subtypes of obsessions um, that we find are really um, kind of common in OCD. So a lot of people have that fear of contamination that I just talked about. There's also a subtype that's kind of more to do with persistent doubting. So, you know, wondering if you left your um, stove on when you left the house or worrying that you didn't lock the door. Um, there is a subtype which involves a need to arrange things in symmetrical patterns. So that kind of organization or um, symmetry related OCD, which is probably the one that you hear about most commonly, um, you know, people obsessing over having things in a certain order. However, it, it often doesn't look like the way people portray it in movies and TV shows and stuff, but that is a, a very common subtype as well. Um, and there's actually a type of OCD called harm OCD, where the person has obsessive thoughts that they are going to harm someone else um, or themselves. And that can be really distressing because in a lot of cases, the person has no intention and would never harm another person um, purposefully, but they can't get that idea out of their head that they're in danger of harming someone. Um, so that can be a really, really hard, um, a really difficult type of OCD to deal with and to treat as well. And then some of the compulsions that we see here, 
Um, we have checking, so you know, checking to make sure the door is locked, if the stove is turned off, you might have to check five times before you can leave the house. The cleaning, which of course goes along with that contamination obsession, and repeating actions, which can go along with the surgical pattern or the persistent doubting type of, of OCD. So you can kind of see how some of those specific obsessions that are really common in OCD are related to the compulsion that helps alleviate that anxiety. So someone with contamination OCD, they're really terrified of having germs on them becoming contaminated. That's their obsession. And so then they engage in ritualistic cleaning behaviors in order to prevent that contamination. And that helps relieve the anxiety that was caused by that obsession. For some reason, this textbook doesn't really talk about PTSD. It has a very tiny uh, kind of section on it in the cultural um, variations of disorders that we talked about in the first module, but it doesn't actually define PTSD in any other section. So I wanted to just keep in a slide here from the old notes. You won't be tested on it, but just kind of for your own knowledge. So you've probably all heard of post-traumatic stress disorder. In the aftermath of any type of crisis, it could be war, rape, torture, natural disaster. Often stress and symptoms such as insomnia, agitation, and jumpiness are completely normal. But it's when these symptoms persist for a month or longer and begin to impair overall functioning that they may be labeled as post-traumatic stress disorder. So typical symptoms of PTSD involve reliving the trauma and recurrent and intrusive thoughts, a sense of detachment from others, increased physiological arousal, so insomnia, being unable to sleep, or impaired concentration, and even loss of interest in familiar activities. There have been investigations into the neural circuitry of people who suffer from PTSD, and it has shown detachment as well as increased activity across all four lobes of the brain. It seems to be concentrated in the prefrontal cortex and around limbic structures. And we know the limbic system is uh, heavily involved in um, kind of those fear and aggression responses. Uh, the limbic system contains the amygdala. Um, and so you see increased activity in all these areas of the brain when reading a triggering story. Um, so there do seem to be certain brain circuits that have been kind of connected to symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder. So now we'll move on and talk about mood disorders. Like I mentioned before, both anxiety and mood disorders are probably the two most common types of um, mental illness that we deal with in you know, the, the field of abnormal psychology. Um, and mood disorders are very common. They affect almost 10% of adults in Canada and the US, so one in 10. Due to a combination of biopsychosocial factors, rates of depression are twice as high among women as among men, and three times as high among people living in poverty. And there is also a genetic susceptibility to mood disorders as well. So there does seem to be some kind of genetic basis. Obviously, we all feel sadness at times in our lives, but in comparison, major depression can be very severe and can occur even in the absence of events or circumstances that we would normally associate with a depressed mood. So someone with depression, they may have a depressive episode, you know, following a traumatic event or following something really bad that happened in their life, but they can also have a depressive episode for absolutely no kind of reason whatsoever. Just because there isn't kind of a triggering event doesn't mean that somebody can't experience uh, a major depressive episode. So in major depression, um, this is a disorder marked by prolonged periods of sadness, feelings of worthlessness and hopeless, hopelessness, social withdrawal and cognitive and physical sluggishness. It's so much more than just a prolonged sad mood. So a lot of people think of depression as just being really sad all the time, but there's a lot more to it. In fact, you have to fit a certain number of symptoms um, and they have to have persisted for at least a two week period in order to be diagnosed with major depression. So for example, you have to have some kind of depressed mood um, or you know feelings of, of sadness and they must be accompanied by things such as either an increase in or loss of appetite, um, sleeping too much or too little, kind of physical psychomotor agitation, um, impaired concentration. Um, so there's a, there's a whole bunch of different symptoms um, that can be associated with major depressive disorder. And you do have to kind of have so many of those symptoms and be persisting for at least a two week period in order for it to be classified as a major depressive episode. 
So to fully understand depression requires considering the full impact of life's activities being interfered with by feelings of despair, uselessness, and a lack of energy and motivation. So it's, it's really difficult for somebody with depression to complete everyday tasks that a lot of us would find, you know, super kind of relatively easy to complete. Um, so for example, for someone with major depression, they might struggle with hygiene, even something like taking a shower could feel like a really big task. Um, you know, being able to get out of bed in the morning. A lot of the time they experience a loss of pleasure in activities they once really enjoyed. Um, so it can be a really, really devastating illness to deal with. It's, it's very hard for someone in the midst of a depressive episode to see kind of any good in their life at the time. In contrast, bipolar disorder, which was formerly known as manic depression, is characterized by extreme highs and lows in mood, motivation, and energy. So it involves depression at one end. So somebody with bipolar um, often experiences periods of depression, so depressive episodes, but they also experience periods of mania, which are kind of really extremely energized, positive moves. And so mania can involve things like talking fast, racing thoughts, impulsive and spontaneous decisions, and or engaging in high risk behavior. So a lot of the time, People think that, you know, mania sounds kind of like a good thing. You have a lot more energy, you're getting a lot done, you might feel a lot more creative, but in reality, it can be just as dangerous or even more so as depressive episodes. A lot of people, when they're in the midst of a manic episode, they might spend a ton of money, they might engage in, you know, high risk sexual activity. Um, there's a lot of things that go along with manic episodes that can be really devastating, especially when that person comes back down. Um, from that manic episode, they can realize, you know, they've lost a ton of money or they've done things that they're really not proud of. And that can actually make the ensuing depressive episode even worse. Um, so it is harder to treat um, than depression. A lot of the time, if somebody's in a manic episode, they'll decide that they don't need their medication anymore. Because of course, if you're feeling that good, you know, you can convince yourself that you don't need the medication. And so it can be really hard to get that medication adherence in people with bipolar. There are two different types of bipolar. So in bipolar one, um, it means that you've basically had at least one full manic episode um, and you may or may not have had depressive episodes accompanying that. Whereas with bipolar two, you have to have had at least one episode of major depression and at least one hypomanic episode. Um, so hypomanic episode being a period similar to mania, but not quite to the extreme of, you know, a true manic episode. So for example, if the person is in a manic episode and they end up hospitalized because of that, then that would be considered a true manic episode. Whereas if somebody has a relatively short term period of mania, I believe it's lasting less than four days um, and it's not severe enough to require hospitalization, then that might be considered a hypomanic episode. Other than that, the symptoms of mania and hypomania are, are relatively the same. Um, so the difference between that hypomanic versus manic episode is that having a true manic episode would get you a bipolar one diagnosis, whereas having you know periods of depression interspersed by one or more um, hypomanic episodes would get you a diagnosis of bipolar two disorder. And unfortunately, we do see higher suicide rates as well. Um, in people with bipolar disorder as compared to people with major depression. Because again, as I, as I kind of mentioned earlier, dealing with kind of the uh, coming down from the manic episode and realizing that you might have engaged in, in behavior that, that wasn't so great at the time um, can lead to even more severe feelings of depression than, you know, maybe a person with just typical major depressive disorder. So now we're going to talk about some different aspects of depression. So first we'll talk about some of the cognitive aspects that are associated with depression. So depressed people tend to develop a pessimistic explanatory style. And basically what this means is that when something bad happens, they tend to make internal personal attributions. So if you think back to the attribution theory from chapter 13, the uh, social psychology stuff, you might remember making an internal or kind of dispositional attribution is basically saying that whatever happened is due to some characteristic of yourself. So people who are depressed tend to be more likely to make those personal or dispositional attributions for the negative things that they do um, or negative things that happen to them. So blaming it on themselves, which is kind of opposite of that self-serving bias that we talked about in chapter 13. 
They also tend to make stable attributions, so assuming that the situation is going to persist, so it's never going to get any better. And finally, as they spiral into catastrophic ways of thinking, they tend to make global attributions, which expands the impact of the negative event into overall life. So basically what they're saying is that bad things happen because of me, those bad things are always going to happen to me, and those bad things are going to impact all areas of my life. And so making those kind of attributions, having those kind of thought patterns is what can kind of really perpetuate those, those feelings of depression. There are also genetic risk factors related to depression as well. And the diathesis stress model illustrates the interaction between a genetic predisposition for a disorder and life stress. So diathesis stress models basically show you that, you know, everyone has their own kind of predisposing factors. So maybe genetic influences or events that happened in the past that make them more or less likely to develop a mental disorder. And then when you combine those with the stress that somebody's undergoing currently in their life, um, those two things interact and can make any individual person more or less likely to experience a, an episode of mental illness. So if somebody already has a really high, you know, genetic and, um, you know, past history of, of negative events that might make them more susceptible to depression, undergoing even just minor stress or really nothing in particular at all can be enough to trigger a depressive episode. Whereas if you have somebody who has a lot of protective factors, so they have really good social support, they've had really positive experiences, um, and they don't have that genetic predisposition, undergoing the same types of life stressors, you know, even if it's something that's much more significant, it may not be enough to trigger that depressive episode. So in any, any individual case, basically it's a combination of that individual's vulnerability factors and the current stressful life events, which is why it's called the diathesis stress model. So here's a little figure that kind of shows those three elements of the depressive explanatory style. Um, so for example, internalizing, you might say something like, I'm so stupid, it's my fault, I'm a bad person, I am worthless. Stabilizing, it's always going to be this way, things are never going to change. And then globalizing, this kind of applies to everything in every situation, um, not just the current situation. So for example, we have this person here and he's saying, you know, I'm so stupid, I always lose my keys, this ruins everything. So you can see those three elements of that depressive explanatory cell there. And now we're going to talk a little bit about suicide. So I recognize that this is a really tough topic for a lot of people. Um, I won't be testing you on the information here. So if suicide is something that you find particularly hard to talk about, then feel free to kind of end the lecture here. Um, however, I do feel like this information is, is really important for us to cover um, because, you know, it's something that is much more common than people think. And the more educated we can be about it, the, the better we are able to kind of prevent it. So as you may know, I think I've mentioned this a time or two in class, I actually am a suicide line responder with Crisis Service Canada, um, and I've also volunteered with suicide and crisis lines in the past. So I think it's something that's really important to talk about and to educate people about. So for people who have not experienced a mood disorder, it might be difficult for you to imagine how someone could reach such a low point that they would consider suicide. Nonetheless, suicide remains a serious public health concern. It is the second leading cause of death among Canadian youth um, after traffic accidents, I believe, is the first cause. There's variation in who is most likely to die by suicide. So we do see that completion is four times more likely among males than females. So even though females tend to attempt more often, males tend to choose more lethal methods and are therefore more likely to complete suicide. You'll notice that I'm saying complete um, and die by suicide rather than commit suicide. And I would like to let you know the reason for that. We actually, um, in the suicide prevention community, do not use the word commit when referring to suicide anymore. It has a really negative connotation. It makes it sound more like a crime. And so therefore we will always say die by suicide or completed suicide rather than commit suicide. So that's just something that is important to note and, and you know, please, if you can make an effort to kind of use that terminology when discussing suicide rather than than saying the word commits that is something that we're kind of trying to work towards um, so again we do see that completion is four times more likely among males and the highest rates are actually an elderly population so a lot of people tend to think that suicide is is a problem more so for younger people than for older people but we actually do see the rates among people age 65 plus is 60 percent higher than the rates for teens 
In many cases, there are clear warning signs that are evidence, so it is important for us to understand these risk factors, such as suffering from a mood disorder, having extremely stressful life events occur, um, the access that somebody has to lethal means, and concurrent substance use, so use and abuse of substances um, can be related to, to higher rates of suicidality, um, and to know what signs to look for. So again, I know it's not an easy topic to talk about, but I do think that it's something we need to normalize talking about more, and I do think that it's really important for us um, to, to go over some of these risk factors because, you know, it may help save a life someday. So table 15.4 from your text has the warning signs of suicide. I was really, really pleased to see in this new edition of the text, um, the, the older edition actually had talks about committing suicide, but this newest edition that just came out this past year um, now says talks about dying by suicide. So that was a really, um, a really important change, I feel. Um, and so these are some of those warning signs, talks about dying by suicide has trouble eating or sleeping, exhibits drastic change in behavior, withdraws from friends or social activities, loses interest in schoolwork or hobbies, prepares for death by writing a will and making final arrangements, gives away prized possessions, has attempted suicide before, so somebody who has attempted suicide has a much greater risk of attempting again, takes unnecessary risks, has recently experienced serious losses, seems preoccupied with death and dying, loses interest in their personal appearance, and increases alcohol or drug use. So of course, these aren't always necessarily risk signs for suicide, but they are things to kind of keep an eye out for. Then I will tell you one thing, because I know that this is probably one of the biggest myths surrounding suicide and suicide prevention. People tend to think that asking somebody about suicide makes them more likely to do it or makes them more likely to kind of think about it. And that's actually a really big myth. It is not the case at all. Asking somebody if they are thinking about suicide is kind of the number one recommended thing to do when you think that somebody might be considering suicide. If it's not something that's in their mind, it is not going to be more likely to put it there. But if it is something that's on their mind, they are much more likely to actually be honest with you and talk about it. Um, and that can give you an opportunity to kind of maybe suggest resources or, or help them get the help that they need. So definitely if you feel that someone you know is at risk of suicide, um, you can have that conversation with them. The more we have these conversations, the more it kind of normalizes those feelings. Um, as, as awful as they are, we know that over 90% of people will contemplate suicide at one point in their life. So it is something that we wish should be talking about more. And for the end of this module, I know this is some heavy stuff, but I do want to leave you with some important numbers here. So if you or someone you know may be at risk of suicide, here are some helpful resources. We have Kids Help Phone, um, which I'm sure you've all heard of. And what you might not know is actually that service is available for anyone um, under 20 years of age. So some of you may still kind of fit in the category for the services that Kids Help Phone provides. And then the Canada Suicide Prevention Service, um, that's the service that I was talking about that I actually work with. So this is their number here. They are available 24 seven and we also have a text option. Um, so you can text 45645. Four, um, that one is only available from 4 p.m. to 12 a.m. Eastern daily. Um, so the text service is only available for eight hours a day, but the, the phone number is available 24 seven. So please, if anyone you know, um, you know, maybe at risk of suicide or if you're struggling with suicidal ideation yourself, I would urge you to reach out um, to either of these numbers and they can be really helpful in providing you with resources that you might need. So that's the end of module three. I hope you enjoyed the information. I'm sorry to kind of end on such a heavy note. Um, so the next section, the, the final module for this chapter, we're going to be talking about schizophrenia. Schizophrenia is probably one of the most devastating types of mental illness, but it's also one that I find really fascinating because there are so many different varieties and symptoms and things like that. So hopefully you'll enjoy that module and I will see you in the video.